Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, as Andrea said, I've had the great fortune of uh, having the opportunity to come back to uh, Chicago and work at Rush after 15 years at Case Western Reserve, uh, which is a great place uh, as well. So um, the very narrow topic for this morning uh, for me was prostate cancer. I didn't exactly know what, what to do with that. So um, we're going to do a broad uh, flyover as how uh, uh, prostate cancer is managed and seen by urologists and urologic nurses. Um, it's obviously a field and a, uh, a subspecialty where there's medical oncology, there's radiation oncology. It's you know, an ex extremely deep hole we could get into, but we'll, we'll stay on the top and try to leave with some, some knowledge that uh, we can hang on the framework that you already have. I'm sure you all have a lot of experience with this. So as you uh, know, it's the most common uh, non-cutaneous malignancy in men. Um, and 27% of all non-skin cancers in men. So very, very common uh, presentation. 15% uh, percent of men, one in seven, get diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. And one in 38, or two, almost 3%, 2.5%, die from prostate cancer. And the incidence, I'll show you some slides, really varies dramatically by race, uh, African-American and Jamaican uh, African descendants. Uh, are at very high risk of very aggressive prostate cancer, and we're really not exactly sure uh, why that is. So here's another uh, schematic that you may have seen, and you can see that estimated new cases of prostate cancer annually in 2018 uh, was 174,000. Uh, that, that's a lot uh, for men uh, and breast for women. Everything else uh, pales in comparison, and then deaths, Prostate cancer is the second leading cause of, of death for men after lung, uh, after lung cancer. So a uh, very real problem that uh, merits some discussion. So age at diagnosis, prostate cancer disease of senior men, right? No, almost nobody has prostate cancer under the age of 40. It is an anecdotal disease at between 40 and 50. And then you see when you get to 60, 70, 80, it's so an awful lot of prostate cancer. And then a little fall off at 85 to 90, probably because these are the folks that were not predestined to get it and outlived, they grew out of the risk factor. So as we, as we age, we grow out of risk factors for different disease processes, childhood cancers. You sort of dodge that bullet, these guys. If you make it to 90, probably dodge that, that bullet. Um, we're all familiar with PSA and its controversy. Right, it's the, it's the broadest applied screening tool uh, for prostate cancer. And this, we used to show this slide a lot. I don't know if you guys have had some familiarity with it uh, in the past. Um, but here's 1975 to 1990. And we have this little, little grind going up, little slight curve of new cases of prostate cancer from the SEER database. And then, boom, we introduced PSA and all of a sudden there's all of these new prostate cancer cases that we've identified. And then a couple years later, we've sort of fixed the curve, right? So um, when I'm talking to the residents, I always say, what happened here? Like, did we cure all these people? And then not really, this is an incidence prevalence problem. So there was an awful lot of disease in the pool that nobody knew they had. Before PSA screening, the only way you knew if somebody had prostate cancer is if they had an abnormal digital rectal examination or they had symptoms both of which are not great ways to present with prostate cancer. Cure is a lot less likely. Uh, you, you almost assuredly have a higher risk of uh, advanced disease. And then here's the, here's the guys that die from prostate cancer. Um, and you can see we've had this nice downturn here to about 2014 is as far as this goes. Nice, slow groove, maybe making an impact. And then again, new cases, what happened here? We're going to talk about this again later. This is the US SPF WXYZ ABC uh, re recommendation to stop screening. So all of a sudden, we don't, we don't see any more cases. It's not that the disease went away. We just stopped trying to identify it. And we can talk about that. Um, here's, a, here's the curve again. This should look familiar to you now, right? This prostate cancer curve. Uh, this just shows its relative uh, 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 incidence and prevalence relative to breast cancer. Uh, so no great um, mammography was introduced in 1989. 
1990 as a regular screening tool. And you can see here uh, that they didn't have a big jump. So there's actually, I have some other slides that show uh, there's some controversy about the merits of uh, mammography, screening mammography, which is not quite getting the heat that PSA is getting uh, for guys. So we talked about it's the second leading cause of death uh, for men, uh, estimated 10% of all uh, cancer cases. And again, here's this big sweep, uh, average number of uh, deaths per year for prostate cancer goes up. This is a disease of elderly, elderly men. There were some studies in the 1970s that, and I like to quote this, that if you live to 90, uh, almost every man has some microfocus of prostate cancer in their prostate. Whether, whether or not you think that's really a cancer, right? There's some debate about the lower Gleason scores or the grade groups not being uh, aggressive, not able to metastasize, and should we even be calling them cancers? Um, but if you live long enough, you're destined to be uh, afflicted with it. So same graph, more data. Um, the mortality has been declining since 1991. This is, this is really important. There's been some great work done here. So we're detecting it earlier. We have more curative intent options. Um, there's a little bit different in how we report uh, deaths in the hospital, so maybe that impacted it. We have improvements in, in therapies for advanced disease, right, in the last five, seven, 10 years. What we've had, uh, Extandi, um, Provenge, all of these uh, agents. Uh, and people are dying from other things. I like to tell my patients that have an indolent prostate cancer who might be 80, that I would appreciate if they would do me the courtesy of being gracious enough to die of something else. <laughs> so, um, because part of the job is providing that reassurance and you guys are on the front lines for that. So this is, this is a slide, I have two slides here about the racial difference in. So African Americans and Jamaicans of African descent have the highest incidence of prostate cancer in the world. And they have a greater decline in mortality since the early 1990s, but the death rates are still two and a half times higher. I'm gonna to toggle these two slides because I have the graphs backwards. So this is the African American uh, incidence of uh, mortality rate from prostate cancer indexed against this orange line, which is everybody else. That's like unbelievable to me. Um, so there's a lot of thoughts about why that might be. Uh, access to care, fear of doctor, socioeconomic status, uh, whatever sort of proteomics are going on internally, genetic predisposition. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to move these curves closer together. Um, and then you can also see uh, 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 Australia and New Zealand, which would be uh, uh, similar to uh, Western culture, U.S. Uh, index against Japan, Hong Kong, and South Korea, much less risk uh, of being identified with prostate cancer. This all led to the, to the thought process that maybe diet has something to do with it, because if you take a Pacific Rim uh, individual, uh, their risk of prostate cancer is far less than someone in the United States or Australia uh, with Western uh, diet and uh, lifestyle. And you move them to the United States, their children have the same risk of prostate cancer as my children. So what is, what is that about, right? So that, that's gotta be environmental, that's gotta be nutritional. So there was a lot of work done in the 1990s on short chain fatty acids and what our diets might look like that cause prostate cancer. Um, we don't, the sort of the research has fallen off uh, and nothing really came of that, but something to think about. So here we have dietary lifestyle envir environmental issues. Like why, why would that be? So it's something to think about when you're, when you're seeing those patients. Uh, so again, the, uh, at a global level, um, there's been decreasing trends in mortality, uh, mostly observed in high-income countries that are using screening. Still remains the second most common uh, cancer and the sixth leading cause of death. This is a real, this is real impact. This is, you know, that's uh, almost a million people annually uh, being diagnosed. Um, same, uh, same slide, deaths per 100,000. Again, black and non-Hispanic. Everybody else, probably not okay uh, that we have that kind of disparity without an explanation. Uh, we said it's a, it's a disease of, of elderly guys, guys that are getting more senior. Median age of diagnosis now is 67, over half, over age 65. And if you're going to die of prostate cancer, it happens in your mid-70s, mid to late 70s. 
we, uh, we talked about this slide. So stage at diagnosis. So there's this whole phenomenon that happened in the 1990s of stage migration. So at original stage of disease is, is it outside the prostatic capsule? What's the volume of disease? Is it in the lymph nodes? Is it in the bones? Is it in the seminal vesicles? Um, in the pre-PSA era, the stages that we were identifying were stage two, stage three disease because it was palpable disease or there were symptoms, can't pee, blood and urine, invading the bladder. With PSA, we started to identify in the 1990s microfocus Gleason 6 disease, right? PSA of 4.0001, and then Bill Catalona, who's now at Northwestern but was at Wash U for most of his career, uh, suggested we use a PSA cutoff of 2.5 to diagnose cancers. So in my training in the 1990s, uh, the only prostate operations I did were for gentlemen with microfocus disease, which in 2020, we would be working very hard to convince them not to have a procedure, <laughs> not to do anything. So now, so the disease um, was, before the USSPF uh, stopped recommending PSA, almost everybody had localized disease, huge reduction in metastasis, and then up until about 2014, non-palpable cancer, so microfocus uh, disease. And here's the, here's the fallout from our, from our government intervention. I don't want to sound too uh, political, political here, but I'm a little, I'm a little, little jazzed up, right? So, uh, so here's prostate. Um, here's uh, the uh, uh, colon, downtrending, you know, routine use of colonoscopy. Here's this big 1990, 1995, PSA, boom. Rates of new cancers uh, with um, distant stage. And then here we go again. We're undoing all the good work that we did, uh, which is really, really unfortunate. See if we can un unwind that. Um, some of why that happened, I don't have a, a slide on that, as you know, is that we were over-treating disease. As a, if you're at all philosophical, as, a, as human beings, we tend to not really uh, do well getting one layer under the onion. So um, have the nail, hit it with the hammer. So have the cancer, cut it out, it is a, or radiate it, or other. And in Gleason 6 or grade group 1 microfocus cancer, we hurt a lot of guys uh, that were probably never destined to have a problem from whatever cancer was happening. And this is where that US uh, government regulation recommendation of D came from. Uh, because then you create anxiety, you create expense, you create surgical complications, you create incontinence, and we really weren't doing a good job at that. And urologists are partly to blame. Uh, you know, we have, to, we have to own it. In 2008, urologists could buy into Linux linear accelerators, uh, to be part of the business model of treating prostate cancer with external beam radiation therapy. And in 12 months, the use of external beam radiation therapy to treat prostate cancer went up 620%. So that's shameful. Right, no excuse on that. Um, we have uh, uh, urology groups in, in Chicago, you know them, they're amazing doctors, great people, who own a LINAC, right? So we're all culpable. Uh, so something to think about uh, in any disease process as we go forward. You know, we have to be good stewards and ambassadors of the tools we have, uh, because there are downstream effects when, when your parents have to get involved and tell you that you can't do that anymore. So a um, lot of familial component to, uh, uh, to prostate cancer. The BRCA genes uh, are implicated, so now we have family uh, linkages between breast and prostate. Um, and these are all the genes that people are working on to try to figure out, uh, are there other tools to identify uh, at-risk populations, uh, and should we change our screening uh, recommendations? And then there's everything else, right? So smoking doesn't help anything. Um, diet, we don't really know, but this Western diet that we talked about, a lot of research into uh, uh, high fat, I can't ever remember, um, is it the uh, polyunsaturated, whatever the, the bad stuff is. Uh, and then um, obesity, right? We're, we're, getting, we're getting bigger, all of us. Uh, so is there increased risk of higher grade cancers, higher treatment failure rates? higher mortality, so all of these things go in. The hormone uh, milieu is interesting. All of you may have had experience anecdotally with patients that were Kleinfelters 
or had no testosterone for whatever reason through their life, whether they were born that way, or had um, bilateral orchiectomy for torsion or cancer, uh, who go on to present ultimately at a young age, 45, 50, with Gleason 10, grade group 5 prostate cancers, very, very aggressive. Um, that's not a new thing that I've recognized. It's out there. We don't really know why. So I don't think we have our, our hands on it. I'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so the big, the big things still are, still, um, uh, are still the history, right? Are you old enough? Does anybody in your family have it? What's your ethnicity? And then the, the prostate, are there pre, pre-malignant conditions, high-grade pin? We used to call that a pre-malignant condition in the development of prostate cancer, if you see that on a pathology report. Now it's uh, ASAP, uh, small acinar proliferation, atypical small acinar Perforation is the diet uh, a player? So those are the things that still are in the absence of the genetic uh, understanding. Those are the things that are we're still using to help drive who's best to screen and who should we leave alone. Um, so chemo prevention. This is what we're talking about. The goal here, right, is to decrease the the incidence and then decrease the mortality and treatment-related toxicities. If we can prevent disease, that's the best thing. Next best thing, if you're not preventing disease, is early identification and eradication, you know, cure. And then next after that is, is uh, disease of chronicity, palliate the disease and hope something else happens. Um, the best agents, right, this is just a best, uh, uh, a best uh, list, would be non-toxic, only help you, don't hurt you, and prevent the development of the problem. So broccoli and cauliflower and kale and everything I'm not a super fan of. Unfortunately, like cheese sticks are never on this list, right? <laughs> so the sulf sulforaphanes are really chemo preventative. So one more reason to choke down the broccoli sprig that shows up on your plate. Um, and this is what it looks like. Two big trials um, that you should be aware of because people reference them all the time. The United States ran the, the prostate cancer prevention trial, the PC. Uh, PT, finasteride reducing the risk of prostate cancer, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor for BPH, by 25%, but also demonstrated a risk of worse prostate cancers in those people that were higher grade uh, lesions, grade group 4, grade group 5, in, in patients that were on the chemopreventative agent. Nobody, there are a lot of explanations for that, like maybe um, those patients uh, shrunk all the non-specific cancers, non-lethal cancers down and made it easier to detect the worse ones. I don't know, maybe there's, a, the, these are hormone drugs, right? 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, maybe there's some effect. So, so there's not a broad recommendation by the AUA, and I don't know what urologists um, are still doing it. I am not recommending finasteride as a chemopreventative agent uh, for prostate cancer. <coughs> Lot of crossover failure in this study, so, so it demonstrates no survival, not useful. Uh, the SELECT trial, um, whether selenium, not VIT, vit vitamin E, uh, might prevent prostate cancer. Um, the vitamin E actually showed an increased risk of prostate cancer. So the trial was cut short quickly. Selenium is probably pretty safe. Vitamin E is a fat soluble, uh, one of the fat soluble vitamins. Again, I don't know that we really have our head around, is it really what we should be doing? I'll give a little sidebar. Um, all of this Americanized mega dosing of vitamins is not, is not worth anything. Um, as you know, if you take B vitamins, you pee them out two hours later, you're not getting anything out of that. The only real study that showed any benefit to supplementation was one Centrum Complete a day. That's it. So taking 5,000% of your daily dose of selenium every day, I'm not sure that's doing anybody any good, might be hurting you. So again, prostate cancer today, or at least until 2014, rarely causes any symptoms. If you start having symptoms from what ultimately is defined as prostate cancer, you have big problems, right? Like you can't pee, your kidneys are swollen, erection issues, pain, anemia, pathologic fractures, uh, edema of the lower extremities, scrotum, uh, all of this is pretty severe stuff. So here's, here's, our, here's the landmark paper, thank you for this. Um, the, uh, 
the goals are to test disease in healthy asymptomatic individuals. And then, as I said, in the absence of successful prevention of disease development, you want to identify the disease as early as possible to impact a cure elim and eliminate it. Uh, here's a, two other trials um, for screening. So the prostate, lung, colon, ovary, this is a NIH study. Uh, no reduction in 13-year mortality between screen and unscreened arm. Terrible uh, design study, didn't really work. An enormous amount of crossover. People in the not screened arm were getting screened. People in the screened arm were missing appointments. So uh, this was one of the big uh, pillars that the uh, prevention task force used to recommend a, a D rating. Um, but it was really poorly designed. The European trial, uh, it's sort of some weird European fantasy. They do everything a little bit better, right? A little bit more organized. There's some sophistication to the accent. 21% uh, <laughs> reduction in mortality uh, redu um, and lower stage of presentation. So they, they're still doing it. They're still using PSA as a tool. And I think we're sort of turning the corner here in the, in the US. So wh why is screening, screening so bad, right? So here, here's your curve, right? You guys know this curve now. Here we, we start using PSA, we s boom, all of a sudden there's almost nobody presenting with metastatic disease, down to 20%. Here's where we started doing mammography in the 1980s. This is the big initiation of widespread programs. Here's breast cancer development of metastatic disease, flat as a pancake. So I'm not saying we should stop doing mammography. <laughs> But why, why can't we do this? And it's because, um, like I said, the, the docs, there was a urologic knee-jerk reflexive reaction through the 1990s to the identification of elevated PSA and then the subsequent uh, identification and then aggressive treatment of prostate cancer, which might have been indolent, um, which created a lot of downstream uh, toxicity uh, for patients and an enormous expense for the health system with maybe not much benefit. Um, so, as we said, it got a D rating, D rating. Um, and then there's a whole list here of groups that have a few things to say. So the American College of Preventive Medicine says don't do it. The American Cancer Society says the guy should have the opportunity to make a personal decision uh, around 50 and earlier for at-risk populations. And the AUA says why don't we have shared decision making uh, between 55 and 69. At the end of the day, what really should be happening in, in your practices uh, uh, is, a, is a discussion right, about its relative failings as a tool and whether or not knowing you have a cancer, whether it's indolent or aggressive, is better than pretending, you see where I'm kind of leaning, <laughs> that nothing's going on. Uh, so um, maybe better to know and then have, beg another long discussion about whether or not uh, the cancer that's identified merits treatment or aggressive watching, right? Active surveillance is, the, is uh, leaping on the disease if it shows any tendency to transform or become something uh, that might be life-threatening um, or, uh, or treated in a number of different ways. Uh, in my practice, when I identify a guy with low PSA, microfocus Gleason 6 prostate cancer, the, the first follow-up appointment is a discussion about well, you have a cancer, like we're not shocked at that, that's why we did the biopsy, and it's really wimpy on a spectrum of disease. Prostate cancer lives from very wimpy to very aggressive. You have the wimpiest kind and a very small amount, and I'll see you next week with your wife. And they go, why, does, why do I have to come back with my wife? And I say, because if you go home and tell your wife that you have prostate cancer, and Dr. Trillo said, don't worry about it, we're not gonna do anything, she's gonna freak out. So we're gonna make the appointment right now so you can come back and we can have that conversation, which happens almost all the time. But that's harder, and, and, uh, and there are um, societal things in place, including remuneration for services rendered, that make it easier for me to go, let's just cut that terrible cancer out of you and let's be done, or let's radiate it and let's be done. So that's what really should happen in terms of conversation. I think urologists are good folks, and we're moving that direction. But when I trained in the 1990s, we were doing a huge amount of surgery on guys that we know now, we probably just hurt them all and didn't help that many. Uh, so DRE and PSA, it, it's really important. It's sort of a, 
it gets a, a, like beating a, a beating a tired horse. Uh, we really should be feeling these prostates. There are about 20% of prostate cancers that are not um, identified uh, by PSA alone. So it's worthwhile. It also like provides the patients with some reassurance about what's going on. Um, so you know how to do it, not that exciting. Only in the uh, SUNA conference do you get a slide like this. So, so there's a couple of other tools out there. Um, uh, PSA density is one I don't, I don't use very often, but it's very valuable. It indexes the total level of PSA against the size of the gland in cubic centimeters. Uh, so if you have high, more PSA or a PSA density of over 0.15 um, on, a, on a statistical graph, you have a higher probability of having a, a prostate cancer than if you don't. And then they tried to index this against risk of high-risk disease, Gleason score greater than seven, as the PSA density goes up. I don't use this, and I don't know that a lot of people do outside of having the value of the gland size. There's feeling the gland, you can, you can guess how big it is, but it's a total guess. Um, and we don't do trusts anymore without biopsy. So you've already made that decision to put someone through just getting the measurements. Now, if you have an MRI, they can often estimate prostate size, so you can use this tool, but it's not, it's not in widespread uh, use. PSA velocity, I couldn't find a good picture to go with this. Um, if the PSA jumps 0.75 in a year uh, in men with PSAs between four and 10, that's how it's indexed, um, you should uh, think about the guy maybe harboring a prostate cancer. The other two uh, things that are out there that I use a little bit is um, PSA and percent free, uh, you may have some familiarity with. So the percent free test is pretty easy to order, it's available everywhere. If your uh, uh, free PSA in the bloodstream is very low, there's a higher risk of you having a, a cancer. Um, it's still, we're all binary, we're all zero or one, right? So we either have it or we don't, uh, but it helps guide that decision process. That test, percent free is validated again for PSAs between four and 10. So I see a lot of folks get the PSA um, when it's, uh, it's 3.9 or, or 2.7 in a young person, then they order a percent free. It's not really validated for that. So, and then another uh, thought is when you get that initial high PSA, uh, I follow loosely the AUA guidelines, which is a recheck, right? So the one point in space, it's worth rechecking. The half-life of the PSA molecule is long enough that it should, you should check it a month or six weeks later. Checking it the next week, as you might often see in referrals, they get the PSA, the primary doc, and then the doc checks it again five days later. That's really the same number. You're not, it's not affecting any real difference. Um, so uh, there can be one-offs. You don't know if the, if the laboratory has a has a, the machine not calibrated right? Things happen. So you often see a PSA of seven, everybody is really anxious, and they come back, PSA is 2.3. And then you can check it again six months later and get a few more points in space. And I tend to believe the low numbers because it's hard to make your PSA go down by accident. It's easy to make it go up, right? Did you have sex in the last three days? Are you riding hundreds of miles on your bicycle? Do you have some inflammation? Do you have some infection? Is there some other, do you have some obstruction? All those things make it artificially go up. Hard to make it go down unless you're taking phytoestrogens, right? You're pounding Joe Theismann super beta prostate or something, right? Isn't that on the TV in the morning when you're working out? Um, uh, saw palmetto, that's a phytoestrogen. Uh, or you're on some of these prostate agents, right? Otherwise, that's kind of it. So if they're not on that stuff, and then who knows what the people are taking supplements from wherever they're getting them, um, it's hard to make it artificially go down. So if the patient's honest, and almost all of them are, they'll, they'll tell you. Uh, you can believe the low numbers. And then I'll give a shout out, because they're supporting us, to our Exosome DX folks. I, I should have put a slide in here, because I do use that tool uh, selectively, uh, which is a urinary test uh, validated for guys with PSAs between four and 10, that gives you another good statistical tool to help guide someone towards a biopsy. Um, there is some risk to biopsy. I have a few slides we can 
get into that. So there are reasons not to do it, right? Like maybe you don't want to know that someone has an indolent cancer, then they have to share, wear that yoke. Like that's an insult to their sense of immortality. Um, uh, but sometimes you need a tool to also push them a little bit to, to uh, do that uh, biopsy. I got a little bit out of order here. So um, prostate cancer uh, gets graded by Gleason score. Uh, there was this pathologist who ended up at Stanford, actually I had the good fortune to meet him when he was still working. And he looked at all of these slides and categorized uh, what the cells look like and indexed it against the aggressiveness of the disease because he could go back and look at the record to how did the patients do. So um, uh, pathology is a little bit like profiling, like those cells look like bad guys, like stay away from them. And, these, you know, we need a little bit better molecular tools, right, as we go along to try to decide, are things really bad cancers or are they less so? But this is what we got. So I always thought this thing looked like some kind of funky tree or quarry or something. So this looks like normal cells, right? And then down here, it's like brain or something. I don't know. It gets totally uh, crazy. And then you add up on the biopsy specimen the two numbers, one to five, that, um, uh, that are the most prevalent. And if it's all five, you have a 10. And if there's some four and there's some five, you have a nine, and you know how this works. Uh, the first number is the, is the more prevalent of the two. So that's where the um, uh, seven, three plus four, or four plus three come in, and they're treated a little bit, they're treated a little bit differently. So fast forward 25, 30 years, we finally get smart enough to call it grade group something. <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five. So we went through all of these iterations. This is a great story in and of itself, like how we score and scale prostate cancer. Um, the, uh, the grade groups are uh, right here and they correlate here and have the same kind of uh, outcomes for patients. So patients would get confused because the scale on their prostate cancer diagnosis went from six to 10, right? Not one to 10 or one to five, sort of like the rate of perceived exertion when you're working out, it like starts at like eight or, or something weird. It's like a weird scale. So this is a very weird, weird scale for patients. And that's because on biopsy before 1992, um, they used to report, you know, Gleason score four prostate cancer or Gleason score some, Gleason some five prostate cancer. We don't see that anymore, period, ever. And that's because Dr. Epstein at Johns Hopkins looked at all of Pat Walsh's uh, data and decided, or something along the lines of 80% of the, anything less than Gleason six on biopsy, the fours, the fives, the threes, actually were sixes or sevens or eights. So we're not calling fives uh, or fours or threes on biopsy anymore, you will never see that. And now a lot of us use this nomenclature because it's easier for patients to understand. It's linear, it's one to five, five is bad, one is good, easier to talk about. Um, any talk on prostate cancer is remiss in 2020 if we don't talk about MRI. Uh, this, is, this is a great tool. Uh, it's still in its infancy. We don't quite have it worked out. Um, there's a number of ways to apply it. Uh, the multi-parametric, that big word, MP, MRI, is because they do a whole bunch of diffusion gratings uh, on the gland itself to try to see where the, where the cancer is. So prostate cancer is infiltrative. You guys have seen CAT scans. Let me see if I have a, I'll jump ahead a little bit. So here's a CAT scan of the prostate. That's, that's so lame, right? There's no, there's no bump here. There's no weird nodule. These are the seminal vesicles. This is the rectum. This is the urethra with a foley in it probably. This guy's got a big gland. You can't, you can't see anything. So useless. You know, you get a CAT scan of the lung, no problem. You get a CAT scan of the kidney, big bulge on there, liver, pancreas. All of these things are very easy. Prostate cancer is very infiltrative. So in, in 2020, still on occasion, we are blindly stabbing this tomato 12, 16, 18 times, hoping that we identify some bad cells. Like this, this is the weirdest thing ever. It's blind diagnostics. Um, so if we go back, the prostate cancer on whole mount looks like this, but on, you saw on the CT, it's, it's, it's uh, not helpful. So by using uh, the, um, the electron spin profile uh, and contrast, you can see actual activity of the cells different from the surrounding normal tissue. So the way MRI works, you probably know, it's a giant magnet, right? There's no radiation, it's a huge magnet. 
uh, Tesla, one Tesla, not the car or the guy, but one Tesla is a unit of measurement of the gravitational pull of the Earth. That's the frame of reference. So what are our Teslas now? We have 3.5 Tesla magnets, right, for these MRIs. So somebody figured out that you could fire up a magnet with three and a half times the gravitational power of the Earth and not rip a hole in the space-time continuum. <laughs> they were either very cavalier or very smart. Uh, and here we all are. What that magnet does, and this is about to exhaust everything I know about MRI, so I don't want you to think I got some great data, is it pulls every electron in your body, it polarizes you. Again, I don't know how they knew we wouldn't just fall apart, <laughs> turn into liquid, but it pulls all the electrons, and the rate at which the electrons return to their normal spin in every cell in your body is different for different kinds of tissue. So that's pretty smart stuff. So the fat is different than the, than the connective tissue, is different than bone, is different than nerve tissue, which is why MRI gives you such incredibly detailed visibility of, of soft tissues, right? The ortho guys love it because you can see the whole soft tissue of the, of the shoulder or the hip, which you can't see you know, on, on this junk, right? Like not, not useful, some muscle, this guy might be a little well marbleized, and not much else. So that's, that's what this multi-parametric component is. And then they use the PIRADS, which has nothing to do with prostate, actually. PIRADS grading system to try to give you an index as to whether or not um, there might be a clinically significant, and all these words are important, cancer present. So um, uh, the, uh, if, you have a, if you order an MRI on somebody, and we used to do it only, it was only approved by insurance to do after a negative biopsy. Uh, now, I'm actually getting a lot of them before the first biopsy to drive targeted biopsies, so they're getting paid for, so that, that's helpful. Um, if you, what I tell the patients, and this is loose numbers, but if you have an MRI of the prostate and it doesn't show anything on there, there's an 80% chance you're fine. There's a 20% chance you're not, because some of the more aggressive prostate cancers like Cribriform, grade group four cancers, these are bad cancers, do not have any MRI uh, signature. So you have to then you use other uh, tools like uh, PSA kinetics. What's that PSA velocity? What's the absolute PSA? What's the percent free? What, what other tools do you have to decide whether or not to biopsy? Because negative MRI doesn't mean you're in the clear. I also tell patients that if you have something on the MRI, a bump, right, or something suspicious, a pyrads, three, four, or five lesion, there's a 90% chance that that is something real. So that if that shows up, we have to do the biopsy. So if we're going to go down that road, we're not going to find a thing on the MRI and then say we won't worry about it. <laughs> so that's the, the loose numbers I use to give to patients to help them understand the, the uh, limitations of the, of the test that we're applying here. So this slide shows one of the challenges with prostate cancer also is that prostate cancer is sporadic and multifocal. Right? This is not one cancer that grows and pushes stuff out of the way here, right? Um, this slide actually shows very nice the, the bph -E stuff, and then you can see the capsule out here, which is where most of the cancers are, and it demonstrates this uh, really well. The, um, so there can be multiple foci, so the treatment, and I'm going to get to this in a couple minutes, um, a prostate cancer really until just the last few years has been whole gland eradication, right? So if you identify this cancer on biopsy, you may have missed this one. So focal therapy is something that was a little bit controversial uh, in the pre-MRI, pre-mapping era. Um, so when we radiate the gland, we radiate the whole gland, PSA goes to nothing. When we cut it out, we cut the whole thing out, PSA goes to nothing. If you freeze it, whole thing gets frozen. So when you brachytherapy it, you go to treat the entire gland. That's where that comes from. Like why we're not doing male lumpectomies. That word, those words have come up, prostate lumpectomies. So, all right, here's the CT that we've all figured out is useless. So here's a, again, look at this anatomy here, right? These are the levator muscles, the big pelvic muscles that cause chronic pelvic pain, chronic prostatitis and their purpose in large part is to hold you inside so you don't, you've seen a skeleton at Halloween, like you can, there's a hole in the bottom of it. So this holds everything in. Here's rectum with an endorectal coil in it. So we don't do that anymore either, that torture. Um, symphysis pubis up here, and then here's the prostate with the BPH zone here, and then here's an abnormal focus, right? This is, this is great stuff. 
you can see how you could direct a needle into that with or without fusion guidance. So MRI is great for treatment planning too, right? This is bad news bears over here. So this is a little bit of bladder. Here's your hip joints right here. And this is rectum. And you can see this is cancer that is just filling the seminal vesicle and growing past it. So you gotta be able to advise a patient in the absence of disease in the bones or somewhere else that surgery, if we do it, may not be curative. You may need adjuvant radiation or Maybe you need neoadjuvant, concurrent, extended androgen deprivation and external beam radiotherapy to the whole pelvis for something this big. So MRI really gives us a nice, a nice view of that. Here's a, here's a mess. So this is prostate cancer, all of this, invading the bladder, right? Growing into the bladder. So to surgically cure this is exoneration, right? Removal of the bladder and the prostate. Often these folks have disseminated disease, so we don't put them through that life, uh, lifestyle, life-changing operation. So a little bit about, here, I'll go here first. So you may have some experience with um, MRI uh, fusion truss biopsy. Now, it's really in 2020 becoming standard uh, of care. I mean, those are, those are dangerous words to use because if people aren't doing it, they're not doing it wrong, but you really can guide uh, the needle into the lesion. There's a number of different ways to do it. I do a lot of cognitive fusion because I'm old and impatient with the setting the whole thing up. So you look at the MRI and you know where the lesion is and then on the ultrasound you can direct the needle there three or four extra times and sadly my hit rate is pretty good. Um, people that are really leading this field do either in gantry biopsy so the patient is in the MRI machine at the time and they're putting a needle directly into the specific area, which is probably how things really should be done. And you guys have experience with the, with the in-office fusion machines. Um, there's a few of them. There's a little kabuki theater going on with that, like where you're dialing up the, making the ultrasound lay over the thing. Oh, it's not lined up, but we'll just dial this thing and make it line up. It's a little weird, right? It's a little weird. Um, but I think the technology will continue to sort itself out as we go forward. You know, the prostate biopsy is not without not without risk, right? So um, there's a one to 2% chance of sepsis. These are not 18 year olds. So sepsis in an 80 year old or 75 year old or 65 year old, they could kill them. Uh, so that's a real problem. Usually it's a multi-drug resistant organism. Uh, hemorrhage is very rare, but when it does happen, it's a big deal. So it's not, it's not that it's a, a, a non-issue to, uh, to do a prostate biopsy. The next wave, if you're not already seeing it, um, it's already picking up speed. We're doing it at our institution, is transperineal biopsy. So ultrasound wand in the rectum, but the needles go through the space between the rectum and the scrotum. Uh, so they call it Trexit, transrectal exit, like Brexit. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, the data will bear out uh, uh, when it hits the community. Um, incidence of infection is 0.1% you know, uh, bacteremia. So that, that's the future, is doing the biopsy right through this space here without uh, egress, you know, transgressing the, uh, uh, the GI tract. And then this is also the next wave. We're offering a program uh, at Rush. Uh, we used to do cryo, we are now doing HIFU for focal therapy, so to treat just the lesion. So treating prostate cancer is um, fraught with uh, uh, morbidity, right? It's, a, it's an operation, there's risk of bleeding, there's risk of all of the surgical issues uh, specific to the operation, rectal injury, hemorrhage, or otherwise. Um, but then cardiac, some, you've seen folks not do well uh, where they just are not of a constitution that they could undergo that assault. Um, so whole, whole gland radiation is not without side effects. When they happen, they're terrible. Uh, rectal burns, bladder burns, skin burns, bladder irritability uh, is all very real. Urethritis, urinary incontinence, all real stuff. Uh, and brachytherapy is the same. You, there's, uh, I used to have a practice that did quite a bit uh, rectourethral fistulas from aberrant seed placement. Um, so uh, focal therapy, maybe lumpectomy, prostate lumpectomy is the, is the thing to do. Uh, one way to do it is to freeze it. Another way to do it is to cook it. All right, so heat and cold work great. 
Um, and then there's another option, which is limited brachytherapy seed placement. These brachy seeds are different than external beam radiotherapy. They are uh, gamma rays, which are really wimpy. Um, David Banner, Incredible Hulk, he didn't die, right? When the machine went crazy, he just got superpowers. The, uh, they're very short wavelength, so they don't travel very far. So there's very limited um, injury to surrounding tissues. So now we've exhausted everything I know about that. So I brought with you for just the last few minutes, have you guys seen some video of uh, robot prostate? Um, it's, it's pretty good stuff. It's what we do as urologists, as our um, workflow every day, and I'll fast forward it a little bit. So when this starts, the surgeon here is already in the abdomen, and this is what the surgical planes look like. He's gonna do the lymph nodes first here. So this is all colon and whatnot and bladder. And this is the patient's right side. You're looking from the head down into the feet. And he's just opening this stuff up. And you see how the tissue planes open. So when you're operating, you're always thinking, what can I hurt here? So in this particular area, this is the area, that's the vas deferens. So you're gonna divide that as part, of the, uh, as part of the removal of the prostate. And then identification of the big vessels that go to the leg, the iliac vessels, are, are gonna be right in that space. So this is what that da Vinci product looks like. Um, when I trained, and in my training, I did over 150 open radical prostatectomies for training, right, in the 1990s. Um, I trained before the era of the robot. I'm never going back. Uh, I don't know what operations you guys do every day where better vision is a problem, but this is really good stuff. So I was on the camp of some of my, my colleagues, friends, who we were on the camp of, ah, robot's not so great, you know, whatever. The visualization here is, is awesome. And pelvic surgery is fraught with a lot of risk of, um, of uh, bleeding and doing all of the venous bleeding and doing all of this under pneumoperitoneum, there's no, blo there's no blood loss, it, which makes, it, unless you cut something you shouldn't have, uh, which makes all of this very, uh, uh, let's see if we can help this a little bit here. So here, we'll, do a little, we'll let them do this a little bit. So you can see the iliac artery here pulsing away. He's, doing the, he's gonna get the lymph nodes out of that obturator packet is what's going on. And then the structure to preserve uh, is the uh, obturator nerve, which is right here. You don't wanna cut that. That's a motor nerve, 90%, 10% sensory nerve to the uh, inner thigh. So uh, if you cut the left one, a little bit hard to get the leg in the car, right, for real. If you cut the right one, a little bit hard to get the foot on the brake, right? So these are, um, these are real problems. <laughs> now, fortunately, the universe, the God, the nature, whatever your ideology is, put us together pretty well that you can recruit all kinds of other muscles, and there's not a lot of uh, functional limitation, but you don't want to uh, cut that nerve if you can. Um, and so here, I'll move, uh, I'll move this along a little bit again, because I want you to see the prostate part, which is really the interesting part. How did I do this? Here we go. So there's the vein. All right. All right, so here's some prostate. So this is the endopelvic fascia here. Prostate is here, and he's gonna open up all of these muscles now and separate them. The prostate uh, is like a breast. So when little boys, if you operate on an eight-year-old boy, there's no prostate in the pelvis. There's just a urethra with, I guess, some glands, just like an eight-year-old girl has breast tissue, but it hasn't developed. And then when they go through uh, puberty, they grow this gland in the pelvis around the urethra, and it's a secondary sex organ. It makes the survival enzymes for the sperm to make it in that very hostile environment of the vagina to get to the egg. That's what the thing does. Um, so getting it out of the pelvis is a little bit of a challenge because it pushes the normal muscular structures and tissues out of the way as it grows and it's embedded in the muscles of the floor of the pelvis. Which is why chronic prostatitis, beyond the scope of this talk, is probably, in a lot of patients, some pelvic floor tension issue and the prostate is guilty by association, right? So antibiotics are not gonna fix tight pelvic muscles, right? So this is that tool. So there's a big venous complex on the top of the, uh, 
on the this is prostate. Um, yeah, this is prostate right here. And he's cleaning off the fat here to show you the gland, and then a little bit more, and then I got to be done because I'm creeping into my partner's time. Let's see here. So we get all that chub out of the way. So this is separating the prostate from the bladder. And when we did this, see there's urine uh, coming out here. When we did this open, um, you could feel it. You could feel the consistency of the gland. When you use this tool, there's no haptic feedback with this robot. It's all, you could be on another continent. You're getting no feedback from the uh, tissue. So everything becomes secondarily visual. You see how the tissues behave while you're working and, and you uh, remove it. So this is, uh, for me, one of the hardest parts of the operation and one of the most anxiety provoking because if you jazz this up, uh, you have a higher risk of incontinence, right? Which is, which is very life uh, destructive. So that's opening into the bladder at the junction. So this is prostate, this is catheter, this is bladder. So you bring that up. And then this is all prostate. Look at how embedded it is down there. Could you imagine doing this through an incision? Like, oh, never again, never, never going back. So, so now going through the back of the bladder. Here, we'll move it along a little bit. So the blood supply of the prostate comes from the sides. You can see there's very little bleeding here. This is a probably heavily edited video. <laughs> Sometimes there's bleeding. Um, and you want to be uh, judicious in your use of uh, energy, electric pottery or otherwise here so as to not injure the nerve structures that might uh, leave them with some uh, erectile function, right? That'd be best. I tell guys, wherever you are today, preoperatively is your new 10. None of this stuff makes anything better. And there is no cable nerve. You saw that nerve, the obturator nerve. There isn't like nerves like that lying along the prostate because of the way it grows, the way it pushes all the tissues out of the way. What it does um, is there's actually fascicles. So you try to leave a, the fascial plane with all the nerve fascicles running through it as best you can. But there really isn't, so now you're gonna go behind the prostate here. So you can see the thing taking shape, right? The, the prostate shaping itself up here. All right, two more minutes. Let's see. So prostate's lifted off the rectum now. This is the prostate here. Rectum is down. Oh wait, uh, yeah, rectum is down. So this is Denonvier's fascia. So this is another little uh, nerve wracking part. He's digging out, looks like the seminal vesicles here, which is part of the operation to get them out in their entirety. So you, this is gland, you see what it looks like? It looks, it looks kind of nice when it's up and free, it's satisfying. The, um, so he's gonna separate this stuff. This is all Denonvier's fascia. This is where the prostate is stuck against the rectum. Um, again, a little nervous here because you don't wanna hurt anything. See how he's working up underneath? So, and this would be, this would be that nerve tissue. See this like weird stuff that's laying on the side over here that he's separating cold incisions cold cutting with the judicious use spot welding of electric cautery to try to preserve as much function as possible. So this is this, this sheath of tissue that would have the nerves. Now, you know, if you weren't trying to save the nerves, you could chomp right through that. Um, but, you know, we can do better. So here he's gonna divide the stuff that's going into the gland, leaving everything down here. And then I'm gonna show you the hookup of the urethra. So, here. so this is how we sew the urethra. So you can see the, the needle drivers here are pretty, you can see the uh, tool has more, it has more degrees of freedom than the human wrist. So pretty good. Originally uh, designed as a um, cardiac tool, the da Vinci robot, and the cardiac surgeons didn't get after it. So the urologist did. So where I was at the, Cleveland Clinic in the 1990s, we had the original robot. They bought it for their heart program, which is very famous. Uh, and then it was like my treadmill, you know, it had laundry on it in the basement, you know, drying clothing. <laughs> Nobody was using it. So then the urologist went after it. So this is the hookup. This is so nice. This, uh, 
this urethral stump here, he's actually oversewing the dorsal venous complex right now, but he's gonna sew the bladder to this, and that's the urethral hookup. That was probably 40, 45 grams. That was not particularly big. What's that? So the really, well, we did, I did recently, like a 220 grammer, which fills the whole pelvis, which makes things a little bit hard. And you know, the really little ones are hard too. Because they're sort of, you can't, am I on the prostate, am I not? This doesn't feel right. So that's a nice sweet spot prostate actually, 35 to 55 grams. Um, the organ, you have working space to get it out, but you also have a confidence that you're doing the right thing. So anyway, so um, I got a minute for questions, if you have any. Otherwise, thanks. <laughs>